going to dive in and walk through basically three core things this morning. And they are going to start and build on each other. Do y'all know what that means, like when something builds on itself? For instance, we started building a little bit of concrete here and making a little bit of a mess, which I assumed so. Uh, <laughs> but we started building something here. And if y'all have ever watched like bricklayers or anything like that, I don't know if you ever have, you know, drove by, right? They don't lay the whole wall in a day, if you're not aware of that. Um, they can only lay so much at a time because why? It's got to settle, it's got to dry, the weight's got to, because if they just keep laying, it'll just start collapsing. Has anyone ever, like, tried to do that while something's still wet because you just get impatient? Does anybody? Yeah? Yeah. Now, I want you to think about that in your own spiritual life. In a moment, you try to absorb so much new stuff constantly, and none of it sticks. And so, some of you, like, when I began talking this morning, because this doesn't count. When I begin speaking this morning and starting in on this, you're going to think, well, I've heard this, I've heard that, I've heard this, so on and so forth, right? But the question is, is, is it sticking? So why we keep going back is because just like bricks on a wall, you lay them all out and you do maybe do two layers, guess what you got to keep doing to finish out a wall? You got to go back and work on the same wall and just keep going, y'all know? Some of y'all are like, I never knew that's how they laid bricks. So there you go. One of the things I think about is building fences. I did a lot of building fences with my dad growing up. And uh, I was just the concrete hauler for the most part. Um, yeah, we didn't have, you know, all the little ATVs and all these, you know, put it on a trailer and drive it out there. We just drove the truck and had to unload it. I remember this one particular fence that we built was out... Uh, near Oakleaf, in Oakleaf, I guess, rather. This is just a funny story. It has nothing to do with it. This is how you rednecks get water out uh, of the back of a truck. Do you remember this, Dad? You were in your Chevy. He's like, you're about to tell something. Yeah. We were in this little Chevy truck. This is back when you had your Chevy truck. And we had a big horse trough full of water. <laughs> and it, there was no water out there, so the only way you get water is you got to fill it up and take it to the back of the truck. So you know what we did? Well, he did, because I was young. <laughs> Threw the sucker in reverse. <laughs> and slammed on the brakes. Guess what that whole giant thing of water does? Just goes, Whoa! and half of it ended up on the ground. <laughs> but when we were building this fence, you know, you don't get to drill a hole and then pour concrete in a post in it, and you're done with drilling holes and putting concrete in a post in it. This one fence had somewhere, what, about 300 posts or so, clear across probably close to 20 acres or so, and building fences. You know what? The first time that we used this two-man auger, you know, we had to figure out kind of how to use it, what have you. My dad knew how to use it, but he was letting me try to try with it, and then you hit rock, and then I thought it was a merry-go-round, you know, all that kind of stuff. If you've ever seen that, like, yeah. Uh, it makes me think of that YouTube video that's like, this is why men get hurt more often than women, and it's guys sitting on a two-man auger purposefully, like, riding on it, or they take a motorcycle and tie it to a, to a lawnmower, and they're going in circles. You ever seen it? Yeah. And so, you know, but after about four or five of them, I thought, well, I've drilled holes. I get it. Who's ever tried to teach a child something, and they do it one time, they're like, I got it. And then the very next time you go and you let them do it on their own, do they got it? Not at all. And this is what it's like in our spiritual walk. So many times you hear something or in scripture and you read it or whatever, and you're like, I got it. And then you just try to move on, but you don't really got it. You know what I mean? I, we just recently were putting uh, steps, step lights in. And there's like 14 of them that we put in. And I let Jade and Levi go to put these boxes again in, in concrete so it's formed up with wood just like this and then you put boxes on the back side and run you know conduit or something between it to where once the concrete's formed you've got little places to run your wires in the concrete anybody some of you are learning so much and you're writing it down now oh, i'm knowing how to do my own little project so i let the boys do it but guess what the boxes have got to be level and stuff guess what the boxes are not level so we had to buy really big lights to cover the mistake I showed them how to do the first. I did one, you know. All right, you see how you do it? You use the level. You do this. Do that. I did the next one. All right, you got it. And then I looked up 30 minutes later, and on the first light that I just got him, even though Levi convinced me that he has got this, 
And he could explain it to me, and so could Jade. And Jade got a little bit further along than him. They even knew what the drill did, how to use the drill. They got that. But when it came to actually holding the drill, who's ever used a drill before? Who remembers the first time you ever used a drill? And you're like, they just made it look so easy. Why, why is it going? Right? But you know how it works. You, it's simple. You just put the screw on the drill. You push the drill, and it goes in. That's what it looked like when they did it. But when you picked up the drill, the weight of the drill sometimes kind of, I don't quite know how to do this. And then you don't quite know exactly how to point it. And, and if you've ever messed with something like, like the, a, a Phillips head bit and you've got it just slightly off, what do you do? You strip out the screw. Has anybody ever stripped a screw before? <laughs> and what is that? You know how it works, do you not? But yet just when it comes to doing it, you haven't quite done it enough that it can just be kind of second nature as it were. You ever thought about that? Now apply everything, every analogy that I just used, apply it to spiritual things. You can hear something like Romans chapter 8. You can get it in your head and you perfectly know how it works. But when it comes time to execute on it, to use it, to do something with it, it's kind of like wobbly and wompy and you strip out the screw and then it's all stuck there and it's just a mess. And so what do you do? You try to call someone to come out and fix your mess. This isn't even, I haven't even prayed and started. This is pure off the cuff, not even a part of my notes. This is just to help you understand, apparently. See, I had an experience when I lived on Lassiter Road. This is all construction stuff because I fancy myself some sort of a construction guy. Uh, and as we see, I'm a messy, not very good at it guy. Uh, <laughs> Now, I decided we were going to remodel a bathroom in this old house, and it all had copper tubing. And I was like, well, I grew up around welders, and I can solder and everything like that. Sweat and pipe ain't that much different. I got this. And so we tore out the bathroom, and we're doing the stuff and everything. And then there was a cast iron tub in this place. I don't even remember how we got it out of there. But I remember we just got it to the front door. And fortunately, someone drove by and said, do you want to keep that? I said, no, take it. I can't get it any further. And they took it. But as I was remodeling this, there has became a new rule in the Thompson household, which is we do not do our own plumbing. Now, I have started to convince my wife that PVC plumbing is, and, and PEX is quite different than, than sweat and copper pipe. But anyways, I'm putting this valve in. And I think I got it at least three times. I've sweat the pipe. It looks proper. I mean, I've even sweat pipe on AC units. This shouldn't be that hard, but it's in a wall. And I, I never quite got the back. And every time I kick on the water, you all know what happened? So about three parts later and everything like that, you know what we had to do? Go hire somebody to get this job done. It cost me way more than it should have. It took way longer. And from this point on, give or take 14 years later, it is still a thing that if there's plumbing, Taryn says, you're not going to touch it. Now I say that and we're laughing, but think about our spiritual walks. We try to do something because we think we, we, we got it. We don't find a use maybe for the fellow believers beside us, or we haven't quite exercised it and kept practicing on it on the daily. And so thus we seem to see a whole mess of things. And then what do we do? Call somebody to fix it. But y'all know the problem? Y'all don't call the right person. Y'all call the preacher. Y'all call someone else who's just as much struggling as you are with it. Instead of calling on the one that can show you how to fix it. Now that was all free. It's not going to be on your bill today. It's comped by the house. But this is what our spiritual walks are like. Like Now when I think, again, think of this drill scenario. Everybody in here has rose, res, risen their hand and said they used a drill before. I was doing the project again. I'm going to use 50 billion analogies till I see heads starting to come alive before I dive into what we're about to talk about. See, I was hanging some uh, racks in our garage just recently with Levi. And he got how to use this drill. And he kept asking me after a few times of me, I'd go, all right, you see it? And I'd go, you hold it like this, you do like this. And I'd go, zip, zip, zip. And what would he do? How do you get it? Like that? And then I'd say, no, 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 let me show you. Levi, you're not preaching. I am. Shh. Okay. <laughs> and so then I'd say, no, no, you got to hold it like this. Right? And I kept helping him along. But I said, I have been using a screw gun and doing this. What's the old, come on, dads, what do you say? I've been doing this 
Longer than you've been alive. I love being able to say that now because I, I heard that for so long. I said, I've been doing this as long as you've been alive. I couldn't even count how many screws. I've, I've done this so many times, day in and day out. I didn't do it one day and then wait seven days and then t- let me pick up a screw gun and try it again. Every single day, I don't think probably for at least six years of my life that I did not pick up a drill. I did not do it every single day. Can't tell you how many fingers that I put. I actually put a screw straight through my finger one time, putting a plenum together for an AC unit. Whink! And then I had to reverse the drill to pull it back out. I've got bruises and scars to prove I have now learned how this actually works. And I can feel when a drill's about to go and I go whoom, and move my hand out the way. Now again, apply all this spiritually. If you're thinking just about drills and stuff, This is what it's like spiritually. When we only pick up our spiritual lives and walks every once a week in a blue moon, even maybe only like once a day or so, or it's going to take us an immense amount of time to ever get used to what it's like. Not only that, when you're really needing it, when it really needs to be done, you're not going to quite know how to use it. And so this is where we are. So let's pray and jump into this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love how he just said this pray and all the guys took off. The, anyone that was a guy that had their mask on took it off like it was a hat. Like, <laughs> just watch that happen. <laughs> Sorry, I could yeah. Y'all got to have some fun. God's a fun guy, by the way, if you're not aware of that. Uh, he's not near as boring as you. All right, let's pray. Father, we're here together and we say thank you. We say thank you for what you've already been ministering this morning from before we even gathered together. From before, the Father, even the, the dawn of time, you were there ministering and speaking as a living, breathing spirit. Father, we pray this morning that our hearts and our ears are open to what you would tell us this morning, that this becomes not just a one-moment exercise, but a lifestyle exercise and change of seeing and understanding who you are to where the very fabric of our reality is shifted to match that of yours. We pray this together and everybody said. So when it comes to this in practice daily thing, it also gets a little wearing, doesn't it? It does. I'll give you an example. I dug a little bit of a trench yesterday. And when I say a little bit, I let my boys do most of it. But for the all of 15 minutes that I did, I walked inside after... (gasps) I mean, when I say a little bit, I literally mean maybe that far, like four feet, you know. And it's wet. It just rained. It ain't even hard, you know. And I'm using the pickaxe, getting it all around. And I'm rinsing my hands off, and I tell me, I said, Mimi, this is pathetic. I should not be wore out by this. But yet, when I was younger, because I did it every day, I wasn't wore out by it. So the weight of, you know, swinging a hammer or using a pickaxe or even the weight of a drill, it didn't really phase me all that much. I used to haul hay. I used to throw hay on a trailer. And I come to think of that right now, I'm like, man, how did I ever do that? And I know I'm young, but I feel very old. So I'm an old soul. So I've heard for every kid, it adds 10 years. So I'm like 53 years old. Oh, 63 years old. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> But we used to go out, if you don't know how hauling hay works, again, I get it. Y'all are like, why are you telling us so many stories? Because one of these is going to hit home for you if it hasn't hit home for you yet. And the reason I keep telling stories is because now it'll hit home for someone else. So keep it in your mind, the idea of this wearing. See, when we used to haul hay, the rule was that the old guys sat in the truck and they say, I'm not going to push on the gas, but I'm not hitting the brake. And they put it in drive and they just let the truck and they're sitting in the truck and they're just going. And you got to keep up. So if you get behind and you got a bale of hay way back here, you got to pick it up and, you know, carry it. Now, my dad was, and the guys we worked with were a little nicer. They said that, and then when we got really far behind, they would at least stop. (laughs) But a bale of hay, you know, weighs anywhere, depending on what type of hay, between 50 and 75 pounds, give or take. I used to be able to take that sucker and just go, and do that hundreds of times, and I could probably do it twice before I'm going, (laughs) shh, honey. What is that? I'm out of practice. I stopped using the very muscles that I had. They're still there. They're just covered a little bit, you know. I'm in good packaging to be shipped with Amazon. And so I still, it's still there. I still got it, but it's just not using it right now. And some of us, that's where we're at. We've had the spiritual muscle, if you will. We've done it repetitively at one point in our life, but now it has been a while. It's been a while for some of us. And so 
when we get into situations, we can maybe execute in a difficult time for a moment in faith or belief or something. But then whew, we're, we're wore out. Why? We haven't kept up with it. Some of us are maybe newer. And we're just like, I don't even know how to use this muscle. And so we kind of look like the little kids that run through here in the hallway. It's so funny. They, they, they don't know when you're walking because they just learned to walk. You got to keep looking where you're going. And so you know what they always end up hitting? Tables, walls, everything. And they're like, ha, 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 bam. And that's some of us. It's like a brand new thing and we're not even sure. And so we're kind of getting bumped and, and stuff but as we keep going in it. And some of us are like those children that they're walking and everything like that. And they go, bam, and then they go on the ground, and it's like that knock on the head reverted them back three years, and now it's like they don't know how to walk, except for they just know how to sit there and cry. And that's some of us. And what does a teacher come along and do? Picks them up and says, nope, we're going to still walk. <laughs> just because you got hurt doing it doesn't mean you quit, and you keep going. This is speaking to someone right now about your spiritual walk, because this has nothing to do. I mean, it kind of is, because it's about God and your spiritual walk, but it's really not in line with it, so someone needs to be hearing this right now. And this is what it's like. But all of this is fundamentally founded upon one core idea, that you believe that all of this spiritual walk stuff is actually real. Because otherwise, you would never do it in the first place. So what I want to submit to you, this is point number one of a 15-point sermon. I'm just kidding. It's the first core idea. If you're taking notes, and if you're not taking notes, I assume that means you have a steel trap of a brain to remember everything I'm saying. And you don't even need your Bible because you've already memorized that because you ain't looking at that either. Or you don't really care about what we're talking about and doing right now. And I invite you to see the door. <laughs> or you can't do that. However, reading and not listening to me is better of, listen, of reading scripture. So you got to have something to take this with you when you leave here. Because otherwise, you are like the child who used a drill once and then is walking out and thinking you're going to remember everything and you're never going to be able to do it again. It is like the guy who has something, and I say guy because this is typically a guy's thing, and got the instructions, looks at it once and throws it away, gets halfway through the Ikea put together and starts forgetting what the next step was and then tries to convince everyone that you don't need these extra pieces. Those were all extra. Now you're laughing, but that's what you do with your spiritual walk. You get going, you think you know it, you, and people are like, well, what about this? What about this? Oh, that's extra. We don't need it. Again, this ain't to do with my sermon. This is convincing some of you guys because y'all don't take this real and don't think it's serious. The fundamental pinning reality of everything we're talking about is that there is a spiritual existence and realm and that is the core fundamental fabric of life. And until that is reality to you, you are wasting your time, you're wasting my time, and you're wasting your entire life in my view, but there is no reason to continue with this. Now, I know many of you are like, well, I'm here. I believe it. Let's, let's do a little bit of a gut check, heart check for this real quick. To the person beside you, right now, list the top three things that are the most important in your life. Go. Top three things. Just boom, boom, boom. You can't blanket it and be like life itself. No, you got to be specific. What is it? Some of you are having to think for a minute. It's all right. I'll give you a second. Tell that person beside you, what are the top three things? Albie, what you telling? Who you telling? <laughs> all right. Now, everybody got your three things? Or one or two at least? All right, now, tell that person how that, what you do to show that is the most important thing. Tell them what you do. Tell them how much time you spend in a week on that thing that you just called the most important thing.
<laughs> so, how many people know how many hours there are in a week? There's 168. Now, do a little bit of math if you've got your paper. If there's 168 hours in a week, on average, most people will sleep anywhere from between 8 to 12 hours a day. Everybody's like, who are these people? There are some people that are sleeping a lot for some of us that don't sleep all that much. <laughs> so let's just, let's just say that out of a seven-day week, 68 hours of that is gone, just so we can work with a good round number of 100 hours of awake time, okay? Give or take. You know, again, we're being a little liberal with this, but it's easier just to do math in the tens. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Someone caught that, yeah. So, 100, 100 bucks, uh, 100 bucks, <laughs> 100 hours, all right? Now, out of that 100 hours, put down how many hours you said that you spent on that most important thing. So, how many is it? Just kind of start shouting out how many hours you spend on that thing. Four or five? So, four or five percent of your life is dedicated to it. No, yeah, in the week. So 100 hours. Wow, this is, I'm glad I'm doing this kind of math before we talk about what we're about to talk about. I told you, we're taking our time this morning to make sure we get this, okay? So 100 hours, who works a full-time job? How many hours is that? 40 to 60, give or take. So let's just go with 40. That's 40% of your life spent on that. For what? For money. Like, you know, you may even enjoy what you do, but at the end of the day, if, it, if you didn't get paid for doing something you enjoyed to do, what would you probably stop doing? Even what you enjoyed to do. So you do that for money. So about 40% of your life is dedicated to the pursuit of money to survive, let's just say, or what you may call surviving, but really is you're trying to keep up with the Joneses or survive and thrive. So there's about half of our waking time, give or take, spent on that. So what do we do with this other... 60% of our lives. Well, the statistical average is that between phone time and TV time, the average person currently is spending about six hours a day to eight hours a day looking at their phone. You touch your phone about 2,000 times in a day, give or take. Like you pick it up and tap it about 2,000 times during the day. That's not saying you novel text messengers. Okay, the people that text novels, y'all probably like blow that statistic out the water. But about six to eight hours. Let's be conservative with that and say it's five hours a day because then that's a half of a 10 and we can do this math pretty quickly. So what is five times seven, everybody? 35. 35 hours out of your 100 hours are spent on your electronic devices of some sort. Now, you could argue what you're doing on that electronic device for that 35 hours, and you could lie to me and lie to yourself and everyone in here, but you can't lie to God about it. You ain't just doing devotionals and on cloud nine with God things. You were laughing at the idiots on the little thing going around in circles and watching comedy, guys, or just watching nonsense drama. So we're at like 75, give or take, percent of your awake time. Now you got 25 left. 25% left. Out of that, you at least have to spend a couple hours a day eating, maybe conversating with your family. Probably not, if we're honest. Because, you know, that hour actually usually gets taken up by this. I'm just curious, like, when we develop really big muscles, like in, in these two fingers right here, Some of y'all are like, he's preaching against technology, that one-eyed devil in the living room. I'm not against any of these things. We use it all the time. We're filming right now. So people can go on their electronic devices and see the good news, okay? We're, I'm not against all that. Nor am I saying you're wrong for working a full-time job. God, scripture says if you don't work, you don't eat. So don't take this and start going religious and weird with all this and be like, so we're going to quit our jobs. I'm not trying to start a commune with you. 
What I'm trying to show us is thus far we have 25%. Let's just say five of that is spent getting ready. Five hours in a week. So that means give or take you got about 30 minutes a day to get ready. Shower, brush your teeth, you know. Side note, the United States would sell three times as much toothpaste as if everybody obeyed the dentist and brushed two times a day. So that shows you how many people don't actually brush their teeth two times a day. Okay, so side note, just fun fact, you know. <laughs> a lot of preaching is based in fact, guys. So we're down to 20%. Is that a passing grade? If my child brought home to me and said, I spent 20% of my time in school, and I, 20%. I got a 20, Dad. I flip out at 75s. <laughs> Y'all didn't like it this rough? Because see, most of you who, come on, be honest, it's always good to tell the truth, definitely in the house of God. How many of you, the first thing on your list was like God, family, something like that? Raise your hand. Now, out of the things I just said, how does that add up? Now, unless you're going to gaslight somebody with how 20 is now a passing grade because of the grading curve, it seems to be the opposite that God or family even rises to a primary thing. Seems to be quite secondary or even tertiary, which means third or lower. Now, here's the kicker. Scripture is filled with the idea in which while you're doing your job that takes up 40 hours of your week, it can actually be spending time with God. Actually doing other things in life can actually contribute to this spiritual walk idea. But tell the truth, shame the devil. It really ain't all that much. Is it? So we have to quit gaslighting ourselves. I'm just using that term because my son was saying, I was like, where'd you even learn that term? Like, I know that term. He's like, it's a popular term. I'm, I'm aware of this. Oh, God. You know what I'm going to do next week, guys? I'm just going to give him the mic and we're going to see what we learn. <laughs> 20 bucks says he goes silent after about five minutes. <laughs> so, shh. So, mom saying no. So when we look at this, we've got to quit lying to ourselves and calling it one thing and doing another. We would be better off just to stop calling it a thing and living life the way that we are currently living it and remove the false notion of the importance of these things and just be real with it and be comfortable with it or to shift the fundamentals of our lives. And I didn't say that. Jesus said that. It's an all or nothing scenario. And what we see described by this is a word that we all say we dislike the people, and the whole thing about it. And it is called hypocrites. <laughs> hypocrites. Only the Harry Potter people got that. Hypocrites. Who doesn't like a hypocrite? I'm a, then y'all like hypocr hypocrisy? You're being hypocritical by right now not raising your hand and saying, raise your hand if you just like Hypocrites. Did I say like? I said dislike. Y'all just trying to trip me up. You hypocrites. So, what is that? Then you probably dislike yourself to an extent. And now we can see why we can't come boldly before the throne of grace, as Scripture says, and all this kind of stuff. Now, don't think I'm trying to beat you up about your hypocrisy, because all of us are hypocritical to an extent. Yes? Can we all agree right now? Jared's a hypocrite. Can we all agree that Albie's a hypocrite? I just I picked the I picked the person that no one would want to say, no, not Albie. We all are. So let's
let's just stop the whole, you know, oh, Jared thinks he's bad. No, we all are, all right? But let's not wallow in that. Let's not enjoy that. Y'all remember the example I gave you a long time ago? Not a long time ago. It was like four weeks ago, but it's a long time to you because you haven't thought about it since. It's like these kids that are learning to be potty trained, and when they poop their diapers, you know what they do? You know what the really nasty ones do? And they're playing in it. How do I know? Because they call me into the classroom to hurdle back the rest of the kids so they can clean up everything. But that's just exactly what we're like when we're over here saying, well, I'm a hypocrite, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> Look, I got more than you do. Now we're all laughing, thinking how gross that is, but that's your spiritual life, guys. Until we begin to say, yeah, that happens, I'm being potty trained too. But I'm not going to play in it. Now, how absolutely disgusting would it be right now if anyone in this room, because I'm looking around, everybody's potty trained in here. And we've <laughs> and we got Jonathan over here playing in his crap. Now we laugh and say, Jared, that's ridiculous. But like the person who has lost the muscle, they had it at a time, here we are, adults in need of potty training. Paul puts it this way. He said, hey, I'd love to talk to you about spiritual things, but you're so naturally minded and you're so much enjoying all this nonsense that I can't even talk to you about those things. You need to grow up. Yeah, you, you need some meat. You need some real stuff. You need to have some real conversation. You need to have some real thought, but I can't. I got to give you milk because you're a grown-up baby. That's what Paul says. This is not Jared beating you up. This is just saying the reality of it. So until we just come to grips with that and say, I need to grow up. It's, it's not going to hurt you. Just say, I need to grow up. Stop being Toys R Us kids. Uh, so, But why do we not grow up? This is all point one, I'm telling you. We're taking our time this morning, okay? We may even have a stretching moment, intermission. Because there's no reason I could sit here and grab this scripture. And I could flip just about anywhere in it and find something good. I could just... Boom. Look, see the first one. <laughs> John. Y'all know I love me some John. This is Jesus. He says, do you not believe on the Son of God? Do you not believe that you'll see him walk with you? For I came not to judge the world, but that they make the blind see. Look, we got a whole sermon right there. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I'm just proving it. And I can flip anywhere and start reading something, and find something good, and break it down, and I could define every word in Genesis, tohu vavohu, and we could talk about the death, chaos, and destruction, and we could go into understanding the terms of righteousness, and all of the messages that we've taught, which are good, I'm not bashing them, we could go in and define them, and we could tell you the Greek, and the Hebrew, and the Aramaic, and well, actually, the tense of this verb is with the asterisk over the top, which makes this a not, and then we could go into talking about all the lexicon studies, and we could look at all the seven seven different words for love and understand each and every one of them in all of their variations. We can understand that this is an accusative sense. We can understand that now this is a nominative sense. And see, so some of you are like, what is he talking about? Exactly. We can set and do all of that. But until the spirit of God becomes reality, until it becomes the four core fabric of the very reason that we breathe, until that becomes the primary notion of when you wake up in the morning and breathing is saying, I am here to bring a spiritual reality to this natural life. Until until that becomes true to us, nothing else matters. I would even submit to you, and I'm going to tick somebody off, and that's cool. I got more family here today, so I got my crew. I'm, come at me, bro. Jesus doesn't make sense to you and is not important to you 
until that is true. You can't get Christ until you know there's a spiritual reality. The world we live in today and the world you live in, keep your mind in today, not exercising of the spiritual things. The reason you can't get Christ, you don't understand it. How could it work? And he becomes quite secondary, tertiary, and I don't even know what comes after that. But way down the list is because there is no spirituality to it. Jesus was just some peasant guy that lived sometime, died on a cross like the other 6,000 people or more that died on the cross within 30 days for the Roman Empire. They really loved crucifixion. And then we just kept learning about it. Matter of fact, he may even be a myth. So be like, no, not at all. He might as well be to you if there is not an underpinning of spiritual reality to your life. Because otherwise, it's a bunch of nonsense that you spout off that people look at and say, I don't, like, what, what? You say this, but this happens. I don't, I don't get it. And it's because there is no underpinning of the reality of the Spirit of God. We take the first words that are written in Scripture for us. Now, you could argue maybe they weren't the first ones written, but they're the first ones in order of our Bible, of the 66 books that we currently have, and it's a really good starting point. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, seen and unseen, everything. John 1.1 1, 1 starts it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and all things that came to be were made by Him. This underpinning reality is not true to the modern church. It is not true to the fabric of how we think. You want to know how I know? She, Rebecca gets it. I say that, and you're supposed to say, tell us, Jared. Like, you're supposed to, like, I want to hear what you have to know. I know this because we take things and we look at a natural situation, we approach it naturally and think we can fix it naturally instead of realizing that the underpinning of all of that is spiritual. If the Spirit of God created all things, what is more true than natural? The thing that created it, that would be spiritual. So there is nothing that currently exists that cannot be in some way, shape, form, or fashion boiled back down to understanding the Spirit of God. Scripture itself says that all of creation is given to us that we may see and know the glory of God. You're supposed to be able to walk around. Your mind is supposed to be so set on the things of God and understanding the fabric of this reality is based in spirituality, is based in his spirit, who he is. So much so that you walk outside, see the trees. You don't worship the trees. You say, wow, how did God do that? Science came to rise because of that. Do you not know that? You don't know that. Let me help you out with that. Science is the word knowledge. Okay. That's all it means. So all of you like trust the science is trust the knowledge. It just means knowledge. And God is omniscient. Omni, all, science, knowledge. Omni, science, all knowledge. Science came to be because people that believed in the creator said, I wonder how he did that. And they began to un try to understand how God did what he did. This is where it all came from. But now we've gotten to the place of saying, because we can explain how something came to be, that now means we don't need the creator in it. This is to help some of you younger ones. Actually, it's to help all of you because some of you say, no, no, we believe. But then you turn right back around and say, do the exact opposite. So I don't buy it. That would be like saying, because we can explain the creation of Jade, his cells and how they culminated together, we do not need Jared and Taryn to bring about Jade. We explained how Jade came to be. There was a cell and there was sperm and all this stuff happened together. And so we've explained how it works. We don't need Jared and Taryn. That's about the logic that that makes. Now you say, oh, well, that's not me because I believe God did it. I don't believe in that evolution stuff, and whatever. Now apply that to other areas of your life. Shall I just, shall I do it, honey? Shall I do it? I'll do it. I'm just, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to whack the bush in the head. You look at your this is the primary thing currently in our day. You look at your anxiety, depression, loneliness, and you try to say, well, this is where it came from. And you try to form factor away in the natural to come up with an explanation for it instead of, and so you say, so I don't need God in it. I've got this. I've got this other solution. The claim of Christianity is that there's a fundamental problem with our world and, and with humanity. Who would agree? There's a fundamental problem. The claim of Christianity is we know the solution, singular, one solution, and it underpins all of reality. But yet, what do we do? That solution is not good enough. Oh, no, it's good enough. No, it's not, because we come up with other ones. This is all point one, and it's not in my notes. You know, all I had written for this was establish the reality of God. And this is where we're going with it. 
until we get this. Underpinning every bit of it. One solution. And now let's listen to the modern church. If you need to fix your marriage, here are the seven points to gain a better marriage. And God is maybe point seven, if that, or the honorable mention at the end. Here are the three points to hearing God's voice better. Here's the way to be prosperous. Now, I have not read every single book ever written, so there may be some people that write books about that and whatever that actually are tied to the understanding of Christ directly. Not indirectly, not subsidiary. Like, like you want to you write a great book? Here's the best book ever. You want to fix your marriage? Christ at the center. Book done. Why is that not enough? Because when we bang our finger from using a drill... We hurt ourselves when we whack the table from walking and not looking, and we're sitting there now broken and hurting. We don't run to God. We run to another man who's just as broken and says, Well, I think I can get a good, yeah. All right, here's the seven keys to understanding the spiritual mysteries of the faith. When that book says there are no more mysteries, Christ revealed them all. If you don't know that, that's actually scripture. So we, we're sitting here claiming, if y'all aren't aware of this, I'm telling you your actual faith, like, or what should be rather your actual faith. The claim of Christianity is that all of this world's natural side is underpinned by the Spirit of God, the very thing that holds it together. How? I have no clue. Doesn't really say. Just says he does. And spirituality is the underpinning nature of it, and with that, we chose to go against that. And so now there's a fundamental problem in humanity and in the world. And because of that fundamental problem, Christ came and Christ is the singular response solution to that. That's the claim. So how much do we do a disservice while claiming Christ and claiming the Spirit of God? Do we actually do a disservice to it when we constantly point people somewhere else? Now you see why prayer is taking a back seat in the modern church. It doesn't sell well. This is the underpinning nature. And when that becomes real, now the good news, the gospel, becomes something that it's a bubbling, it's a bubbling, it's a bubbling. No one knows that song. I'm singing and shouting since Jesus made. It's bubbling, 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 blah, 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 day and night. Maybe I spend too much time with kids, guys. But the good news of Christ does not compel us in any direction in life, except for a few hours on a Sunday, maybe. And that's mostly not because the good news has compelled us. It's because you've been browbeaten to think that's how you get closer to God. Is, that, is this too much? This wasn't even where I thought I was going today. I'm getting really tired of that. I feel like I study all this stuff and I never talk about it. Are you seeing this? Do you see why the church is irrelevant today? Not like the building, you know, buildings fill up plenty. It's got to be the fundamental underpinning. Now, what is the good news? What is the gospel? It started back in Genesis just as well as everything else I said. The good news was that there was a good God that decided to be good. Let's just go ahead and hit that nail on the head. He ain't good because he has to be. He's God. Last time I checked, and I checked pretty frequently, and I hadn't changed, just so you know. There's, there's, there's no software updates to God, okay? It's not like a bug fix, you know, and the New Testament was like kind of bug fix 2.0. God was a little mad. Now he's not mad anymore. It's the same God from the beginning to the end. He ain't changed. And what he decided was from the beginning when he saw, y'all, look at Genesis 
It does not say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and there was all good things already, and so he just said, let's just keep going with this. It says, in the beginning, God creates the seen and the unseen things, everything, fundamentally, fabric together by him. He's controlling it all, and he says, this is chaos and darkness and nothingness, and I'm going to take it and make it something awesome. And then he says, I'm going to do that, and then I want to partner with one of my creatures. Which creature shall I choose? Maybe he should have chose ants. They're harder workers than us. But instead, he could have chose actual sheep, and he probably could have got further along. Uh, but instead, he says, now I'm going to pick humanity, and I'm going to make them very similar to me. They're going to have the same capability as me, this power of choice to choose and to do. And they're going to be my image and likeness. And what I want you to do, humanity, is I want you to take the good work that I've started, all this taking that, and, take, and I want you to now go continue my good work. And I'm going to set you up in this one place that you can see exactly how it works, what it does, and what you're supposed to do. And then you just make it bigger. Just keep going with it. Kind of like me putting in the step lights. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. And if you need me, I'm right here. I got this. And so man was placed in this spot. And man was to continue his good work. And what did we decide to do? I got my own good work. And so man decides to now go do his own thing. This is told to us in the story of the Garden of Eden. This is in Genesis chapter 3. And as man does his own thing, what happens? We make a chaos mess of it. We return the good creation that God had. We return Eden, that place, into chaos and destruction. The very thing that God said he already started shifting things from, without form and void. That's the words, again, y'all want to define it because y'all ain't listening for anything else. Y'all just want some cool little thing to say. Tohu vavohu, and it means death and destruction, chaos, emptiness, void. Nothingness, and he takes it and makes it something good, and man introduces that back into it, and he says, wait! If you're going to be like that, and you keep trying to do it, like if you're, you're in both camps at the same time, you're going to stay like this forever. You're going to stay dull, empty, and void. Some of you are like, that's kind of what my life sounds like. Then maybe, just maybe, you should look at the core claim of the good news, because the good news is, is that there is a way that you can be right back in that place of fullness. And it ain't after you die, people. It's the here and now, but yet also hereafter. Do, do you see this? I know, it's kind of complicated. It's crazy. It's a little bit of like time warpness. Just so you know, the word eternal does not mean with no end. It means no beginning and no end, which means heaven is already in existence. It's already going. You're just jumping onto a moving train, so to speak, if you would... Take it that way, that kind of a concept. So it ain't like you said Jesus three times, Dorothy, clicked your heels and you and Toto ain't in Kansas anymore once you die. The idea is that there is a way and a path in which you can now partake here and now and continue that good work. You get to be a character in the grand story of all of this death, chaos, destruction turning back into the world that God actually intended it from the first place. And you can be a part of that. And by being a part of that, you become the real human you were intended to become from the beginning. A human that is also divine and filled with the Spirit. A human that walks in that. And the good news is you can now. And Christ is... Okay, now, now take this carefully. Everybody take a breath. That was more for me because I was getting excited. And what does the scripture say? Way, truth, life. Way, truth, life. The word way means like path. Guess what you have to do on a path? You got to grow up and walk. And if you want to keep hitting stuff, don't look where you're headed. But if you, if you want to see it start kind of working out, you keep your eye on the path. We used this example last week. Riding a bike. What's the number one rule? Look up. 
There's so many scriptures. They even pepper it in there for us on the Mount of Transfiguration. I believe this is in Matthew uh, 16, I think. I'm not sure of the chapter. Just go look it up. And they're on the Mount of Transfiguration. And in it, it says, they fell on their face, and then when they lift their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. There's tons of scriptures that say this. It says, look to the hills where your help comes from. Keep your eye on that. You're not going to keep your eye on something if you don't think it's real. Y'all remember when I tricked Albie made him think I cut a door in that wall? If you were here. I convinced Albie he was sitting kind of roughly right over there. And I was acting like it was an illustration. I said, Albie, look, see the door. Remember, y'all remember this? And then he was like, ha, 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 ha. I was like, no, Albie, there's a door there. I'm doing an illustration. I need you to go and, 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 and open the door. And even someone on the other side of the room said, oh, I see it. There was no door. <laughs> Albie gets up. What does he do? Oh. And he goes, sets back down. Did Albie keep staring because he thinks there is really a door here? I know there has to be. No, because he knew it wasn't there. And that's your spiritual walk. You walk up and say, uh, it doesn't really look like it's there. And then you just walk away because it's not there. So you don't really think it's there. So you don't continue on. In comparison to that door, you can see that door. And guess what? You're going to walk at it. We love to play jokes on Annalise because she's terrified of spiders. This morning, we're walking into the donut store, and Jade says, there's a big spider right there. And Ann goes, ah! And then Ann, and Jade puts his hand up her back like that. And she looked just for a moment, and then goes, ah! There's not one there. And then moves on. That's you guys spiritually. You come in Sunday, you look at Christ for a minute, and say, whoo! But it's not real, so you leave it. You only keep your eye on something that you think is real and there. If someone had an imaginary hammer doing this, they don't have to keep their eye not to hit their finger because it's not real. If I have a real sword, everybody's eye, especially for Bryce, I'm not going to swing it at you, bro. He is really looking at this sword because it is real. I mean, I think it's pretty, that's actually pretty sharp. That's not mine. <laughs> I'm glad I tested that before I did some other illustration, maybe with it. Why you only keep your eye on something if you think it's actually there? It says, so I'm the way. Keep your eye on it. It says, truth. I am the truth. This is the truth. And then life. This is where we get the idea of eternal life. Not just that there's a life after, but eternal life. I, guys, I said this yesterday, and this is my, my most fun thing to say. I am eternal. I'm not going to die. Now, let's clip that, put it on YouTube, and let's see how many likes we get on that. Pastor says he is now immortal. Yes, but guess what? You can be too. I'm assuming you are. I don't know. That's between you and God. But there's nothing that can convince me I'm not. It's got to be fundamental. And Christ says, I got you. But what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Let's just look at the difference. God, this is not, I don't know what. Let's look at the difference in our approach to Christianity and Christ's approach. It wasn't called Christianity back then. They were actually just called a follower. And then they later, some of them were called disciples if they were directly disciples of Jesus. And then later on, the term got coined Christian. <laughs> Funny thing was, guess who started it? Not the Christians. They didn't run around claiming, we're just like Jesus, come look at us. It was other people who observed them and said, hey. But anyways, let's look at Jesus' approach. Jesus' approach, we may not get to this. Jesus' approach was, hey, follow me. And I'll give you real meaning to life. That's, I'm paraphrasing it here, but I'll make you fishers of men. I'll take the thing you do and make it something really worthwhile and eternal. And he says, so, say a prayer. Repeat after me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, wait, wait. I haven't taught you all that yet. We'll do that later. He says, do you believe you're a sinner? Yes, you are. Okay, cool. You believe in me? Yes. All right. Awesome. Cool. We'll catch you later. Next Sunday. That's not the story, if you're aware. The story is, hey, you want to do this? Let's go. Follow me. Drop what you're doing. Let's hit it. Come on. Every day. All day. Let's go. How long? Till we die. When are we going to die? You soon. You got a little bit longer. 
Me, a little bit sooner than all of you. Now, how starkly different are those two approaches? One, hey, is this real to you? I'm real to you. Yeah, I am. Let's go. Well, what about this? Don't worry about it. She doesn't even get so bold and something. Let the dead bury the dead. I mean, this dude is kind of crazy. What's our modern approach? Just say the prayer. Make sure you fill out the connect card. Let me join our email list. And we'll talk to you on Sunday. <laughs> Free coffee, yeah. <laughs> and we'll catch you later. So let us know if you have a problem. And we'll direct you to some resources. And Jesus says, I am the resource. I'm not going to send you away and elsewhere. I'm going to bring you in. Look at the difference. So I'm sorry. I can't quite say that I'm like Christ yet. Because my approach is... Okay, I'll hang myself out to dry, as my dad used to say. So what is this? Because we don't believe the good news. We don't believe we're a part of it. It has not captivated us to understand that we can be a part of this. Well, it hasn't captivated us and we're a part of it because we don't believe it's the fundamentals of reality. There's a great statement that was made a long time ago. If God is who and what we say he is and Christ is who and what we say he is, it can either be of absolutely no importance to your life or of all importance. The one thing it can't be is of mediocre importance. Because it can be not important in your life and you just go do, but you can't take something that is that valuable and place it in the middle. It just doesn't work. In Romans 8, we were reading it last week, is one of the best verses, or chapters rather, that really edges in on this idea. This is basically what he's building it off of, is starting from the idea of being in Christ and walking in this way. And he's, he's basically taking us through the concept, kind of dragging us through this idea of if this is true, then this. Who's ever heard of an if-then statement in programming or anything like that? It's really popular right now if you've ever used like Ift or uh, Fiverr or any of these other apps or your shortcuts app on your phone where you can do some cool stuff. It's a, it basically says, hey, if this, then do this. You ever seen that? Yeah, it's, pretty, it's basic logic, how your brain works, you know? If the bee's going to sting you, move away, right? Or run and go, ah, whatever works for you. What Paul does is exactly that. And what we're doing is exactly that. If this is true, then there's got to be a response. And if that response happens, then there's got to be this. And we walk through this thing together. Even right now, as I am talking right now, some of you are bored with this entire concept because you just want to hear something new or you just want to hurry up and go because lunch is getting close. Some of you are thinking right now, Jared just likes the sound of his own voice. If I wanted to do that, I'd just do a podcast with myself and record myself, and I can argue with myself really well. It's more fun than talking to you. Let's look at something together real quick. We may or yet get to this. I don't know. Romans chapter 8. We read this on Sunday. If you're in the discipleship with us, you should be reading it every day, so this should be kind of in your head at this point. It says... In verse 1, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, in Christ, He has made you free from the law of sin and death. I like one translation. It says, He has made you free from the law of sin and a vicious cycle of repeating it. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Wow, there's a lot there in the mouthful. I'm not going to redefine all of it. Um, if you're in the discipleship, go back and watch all the videos or just read it and start thinking about it for a minute. What is he saying? He's saying, here's some good news, guys. Some good news is all of the screwed up nature of this world. There's no condemning of, for you. I, I like the example of like the building that is what happens to a building that's condemned. You board it up, shut it up, and you're going to tear it down because it's of no use anymore. He says, no, you're not condemned. You're not shut up, tore out, down, none of that. If what? In Christ. Oh, oh wait, that was a mistranslation, actually. It said, if you say the prayer, that's what it meant to say. It was just a mess up. Don't worry about it. No, oh, you're shaking your head. No, but that's what we take in Christ to mean. You said the prayer. You've been, you've been, <laughs> you, you, you said the prayer, right? You started maybe, it could be potentially dressing right, speaking right. You know, you take off your hat at the right time. Whatever. No, it says in Christ. The word in means in relation to. Like together in and in relation to. So it says there's none of that for those that are in relation with Christ Jesus. What relation would that be? Well, there was 12 people that kind of helped walk that out a little bit. Jesus showed us the relationship with God that we were supposed to have. And those 12 people, that while they're still human and screwed up a lot... Yeah, that's like, a, it's a lot with a loogie in it, like a lot. A lot. But they did show us what that relationship looked like. And it was called what? A follower. Meaning he goes, I go. He don't go, I don't go. And if he tells me to go, I will go. If he tells me to stay, I will stay. When I chop somebody's ear off, he'll help fix it and tell me, hey, don't do that anymore. But I'm in relation. There is now no condemnation for those what? If you're in, in relation with this. Why? Well, here's a little bit of the relation. You walk, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Oh, okay, cool. And then what does it say down here in verse four? For the righteous law be fulfilled in us who walk after the flesh, or not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Verse five says, for they that walk after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. He's saying, hey, good news. The death, chaos, and destruction that you guys entered into the world, you you get in relation with Christ, that ain't applied to you. And not only that, let me tell you what that relationship is. It's a follower of him walking after not the things in this world and looking at that as the fundamental structures of reality, but rather looking and walking after the things that are which are spiritual. Now we had a divine spiritual, we'll get to that in a minute. But then he goes on to say that he says, for those that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Wait, I thought it was those who are after the flesh, have sex outside of marriage, they drink too much, they wear weird clothes, and they also are just nasty people that we don't like. Am I getting, like this is not deep, guys. What does he say? You mind the things of the flesh. Notice that's an internal thing that none of us know. Right now, none of us know what any of you are thinking. I have guesses about me shutting up is probably one of them. But notice it's an internal thing in which is between you and there's only one being that knows the intent of the heart or knows your thoughts. God. So notice what Paul does is drives us straight to this idea of your walk in relationship has really nothing to do with your immediate actions outside of your life. It has to do with your internal life. You know where he got that idea from? Jesus. He said, so if you're looking at the things of the flesh, your mind is going to be set on the flesh. You're mindful of them. You think about them. You care about them. But he says, those that are walking in the spirit, their mind is on the spirit. 
I have found more, this is, this is to help somebody, if you're right, taking notes and writing this down. I have found more utility, meaning more usefulness in my life by simply one internal prayer, which is every time I get into a situation, I don't do it all the time, but I'm working on it, so all right, I'm a hypocrite, you're a hypocrite, let's not point fingers and play with our mess, let's get, let's get going and grow up. I try. This is just a simple internal prayer. God, show me how any of this is spiritual. Show me you in this. Show me how to be you in this. Show me, show me what this is supposed to do. I don't get it. I don't understand. And that's the end of the prayer. And then I just repeat that until God shows me something. The idea of being mindful of the things of the Spirit, if you believe it's the underpinning nature of reality, you will approach every situation towards saying, how is this spiritual? If it is not, how do I bring it? Everything. You know, the crazy thing is, it's a lot of fun. It's like a grand adventure of trying to figure out the true meaning of everything. Who likes scavenger hunts? And they're so popular. Everybody loves scavenger hunts. Who loves escape rooms? You're trying to figure out how to get out of this stuff. It's like life is a giant puzzle of how do you make it all fit together and make sense, not just for you, but for those around you. And if we approach things and think of things spiritually, but we don't. We look at something in the natural and say, well, that's just natural. It's just real life over here. And then there's my spiritual stuff over here. And it sets quite separate from each other. And at some point, I do some things that reflect the idea of I'm a better person in morality and blah, 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 blah. Jesus did not come to teach you morality. That was already done. Jesus did not come to say, let me teach you how to live a good moral life. You already knew that. Scripture says God wrote that on your heart. Jesus came to show us the real meaning and manner of life. And guess what happens after that? Morality is a part of it. Instant, instantly. Is this too complex for some of you? Or too boring, maybe? He says, being mindful of it. And then what does he say in verse six? To be carnally, the word carnally is like to be naturally minded of the things. He says, that is death. He says what? To be spiritually minded, what is that? That's life. Let's break that down real quick for you guys. To consume yourself with the things of this world is to end up in death, chaos, and destruction. Please pray, do tell how, Jared. I have to live my life. I've got to make money and have my job because if I don't, I won't get the new iPhone 15 and it may actually unfold and flip like the androids and it'll be so cool. If I don't do that, I can't have the fastest internet speed. And you know how much I need no buffering in my Ice Kingdom episode? Now, again, I'm being a little bit playful with it, but I got to think about these things. Sure. But it's how you think about these things. Why is it death? Well, let me help you out with something. Death comes when something comes to an end. Yes? So what happens when a tree dies? It's because the life of that tree has now gone. You have a pet or something, and it lives, and then it dies. So what is death? It means to come to an end. Yeah? Fair enough? This is simple. There is nothing in this natural world that survives and is eternal. So thus, you think of natural things, it will come to an end at some point, no matter what you think about. Your life comes to an end. You think about your own life, it's death. Like this natural life, death. You think about your job so much, guess what happens? Who's ever gotten a new job? Who's ever been forced to get a new job? That's a polite way of saying being fired. Uh, <laughs> who's ever quit their job? I remember when I worked for Apple, my mind was on the things of Apple constantly. They do a very good job at brainwashing you. Still to this day, it has been over 10 years since I've worked for Apple and people still, mom, call me and <laughs> just kidding. still call me and say, well, you're the Apple guy. It's like, it's been a decade. You know how much stuff happens in technology in a decade? I have no clue. Ask Caleb. <laughs> Why? Because my mind were on these things. And people say, they, yeah, yeah, he knows. But guess what? That came to an end. And I remember when it came to an end, my wife and I even had this conversation. I was like, I feel like I'm betraying this because like I was so ingrained in it and now it's an end and I kind of didn't exactly know how to cope with that a little bit. It's death. It'll come to an end. 
So Paul says, you keep your mind on those things and focus on that. You're, that is a recipe for disaster because it will all come to an end. <laughs> I can't leave this one alone. We're going to have half-made concrete. I'm going to have to do it again. Uh, <laughs> That's the concrete guy. Yeah, why weren't you up here doing all of this from the beginning? You know, you should have showed up. Uh, so, <laughs> look at it this way. One of the biggest problems in our current society, and that means in us because we're a part of this society, so do not try to play the fun game and excerpt yourself out of it, okay? I'm going to give you a little bit of like, it's going to sound like I'm against technology and stuff again. But I'm not, remember? The Apple guy 10 years ago. I love technology. It's cool stuff, okay? The current issue in our society could be basically boiled down to a moment that gives me a certain particular feeling, and when that is gone, I must retrieve it again. It comes to an end. Natural-minded. Death. This is expressed in how things like TikTok. Who knows what TikTok is? Who uses TikTok on the regular? Anyone under the age of 40, because Ryan's there. Uh, <laughs> no. All right, YouTube, Facebook, all of them are primitive. Who's ever seen The Social Dilemma? It's a movie that's actually telling you how they came up with this idea. As you get, every time you get a little uh, message or a little something or a little video, and it, boom, dopamine hit, and it's like, <gasps> guess what happens? It goes away. Guess what I need now? Another one and another one. And they formulated to say, let's just keep feeding that. And what does it create? Still comes to an end. Because at some point, there's not enough likes on your posts. Or at some point, there's not enough videos that you can find. And then you're scouring, trying to find a video that will give you that funniness or that seriousness or that inspiration. I'm hitting somebody really close to home. Now again, am I against these things? No. We post stuff on the YouTubes. Okay. Not against these things. I'm trying to show you, what is that? Is it wrong to watch the videos? No, keep it in balance, crazy people. What is it though? It's, it's a mind focused on the natural. I've been saying, this is not, the, again, this is for somebody to help understanding the nature of life because I've been saying this a lot and I didn't think it would ever make it way into a sermon, but here it goes. The current culture has convinced you that this natural world is all there is. So if this is the only world that there is, and the goal of it, they've also told you this, the goal of it is to be happy. I saw the most horrible sign in a church. I've said this several times. And it says, do what makes you happy, bless God. No! As a recipe for carnal-minded to, to, to death. Loneliness, depression, anxiety, number one thing. Suicide rate, number one thing. Why? Guys, we're walking around like a bunch of idiots. All complaining about this. Who says, oh, this is such a horrible thing. Raise your hand. Come on. Come on, everybody raise your hand, because I've talked to most of you. You say, it's horrible. The suicide rate's up. Oh, the trans stuff. And the it's crazy. It's our fault. We're the ones that are supposed to change it. But we have bought into the two lies that have shifted our entire culture, our entire world, has made us less than the real humans God intended us to be, because we believe that this is all natural, this world, and the goal of it is to be happy. And when you put those two things together, you get a group of people that say, well, if the goal is to be happy and it's only natural, I only got one life, YOLO. That stands for you only live once. I'm only gonna live once, so I must extract every ounce of happiness that I can get now, because this is all I'm gonna get. So thus you're in a feeding frenzy like sharks with blood in the water trying to get your own happiness and you don't care who you tear up in the process of it. This is what the church is doing, not the world. I'm talking about you wicked people and me. And we're trying to get at it and we're twisting and using scripture to get it. And guess what? Why do you think opioid epidemic is the highest? Because I need the most joy and happiness I can get out of life now because there's nothing after this. Guess why sex is the number one identity thing? Because Anyone who's ever had sex, I could talk to your kids, sorry, knows there's kind of nothing to, like that's the peak and pinnacle of a physical ecstasy. So guess what? How many different ways and people and things can I get? Because that's what I got to get out of life. So that's the most important thing in life. It's death. And we have bought into this and we're just skirting around these things and saying, well, we need to just, you need to do it this way and you need to, don't do this. And, and, we're, and then we're skirting around. But yet all the while, we believe the same things. We believe that this world is 
all there is. Why? Because we don't believe the gospel. We don't believe it is underpinned by the spiritual realm. And it's evident in the mannerisms that we think about life and we do life. We live life for this one and thus it ends in death. And we wonder why we're still dealing with the same levels of depressions and anxieties and loneliness and everything else. And it's because you think this is all that there is. And then you think your job is to get happiness out of it. The interesting thing is, is that when you learn, I believe by having children, it helps us see this. I think that's why God gave us children is I actually am starting to find more happiness and watching my kids enjoy things than I even do when I enjoy it. It's crazy. I don't understand it. I'm I'm learning. This is not a process. I'm learning that when I see my wife enjoy something, I enjoy watching her enjoy it more than if I got to do something I wanted to do. Not all the time, guys. I'm not a saint. Well, actually, I am, but we'll get on that later. Why? I I mean, believe, just put your mind. Who who, who has a child? Or I mean, you always have a child. Like, I mean, even if they're older, there's a point, like, if you have any level of care, like you just can't wait to see their expression of getting to enjoy something, even if it costs you everything to put it together just so they could have it and they could see it. And God says, now imagine that. And you're evil. That's what he says. If you can do that, how much more do you think I got a mind for you? But when that's not underpinning real, we think that we're abandoned here. Like God just said, deuces, you screwed it up. Kicked us out. No, Christ said, I brought you back. But when we buy in to this idea, the nature of life, it's not about your happiness. There's nothing about your life and salvation that's intended for you. (sighs) This is why we don't have a giant church. (laughs) not. Well, don't you think it's a little bit about me? Not if you're following after Christ. That was the purpose of Christ. Christ said, you want to see how to be a real human, like the thing I made you to be? You live so far outside of yourself. Nothing about you. Nothing about your life is even for you. But yet in that complete fulfillment, complete fulfillment, that doesn't make sense. I know it's crazy. But yet we see glimpses of it here and there in our lives, but we breeze past them because they make us uncomfortable because they also make us realize if that is the nature of life, I don't know that I'm following that. And that's the idea of a saint and a sinner, by the way, guys. The word saint and sinner, basically the same term, just in reverse meaning. Sinner literally means one who is committed to sin. What is sin? To miss the mark. What is missing the mark? Not following Christ, period. Because the way he did life, who he was, what he taught, he is bringing us back into that. He says, now follow me. That's the path. Anything other than that. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I think it would be very hard if I said, describe, I'm trying to find this thing. What is that? It's a tub. (laughs) Five gallon, awkward something. It's got stuff on it. It's a container. Describe it by telling me about everything else in this room that it's not. That's the lunacy of trying to tell someone about all of this missing of the mark instead of saying, there's just one mark. Let's go that way. I don't have to define everything else for you. I just got to define the one thing for you. If you had to describe that and try to get someone, it would like, be like playing charades by describing everything in this room and saying, I'm trying to get you to guess, blue water jug. By saying, wood paneling. Don't, don't have wood. It doesn't have wood paneling. It doesn't have a fire alarm. It doesn't have a light on it. It doesn't have a camera. It doesn't have an exit sign. It doesn't have a, uh, are you, do you see the lunacy? It doesn't have electronics in it. It's not a guitar. It's not drums. Do you see how far I could keep going? And all the while, I'm not seeing the thing itself. Enter the modern church. We don't see Christ because we're not following after. We're so busy trying to define what all the non-missing in the market is just to find the path. And Jesus said, this to help you out. I am it. Let's go. But it's got to be underpinned. Otherwise, it's not. So he says, what's a saint? Saint's one committed to that. One who is holy, 
dedicated. That's the whole idea of this whole journey. Why? Because at the beginning, God said, I am a good God. That's what I'm going to be. Now, with the foreknowledge of knowing what that would cost him, he still said, yeah, I still want to see good things. And yeah, I still want to use humanity. Whoa! Guys, that's crazy. When I ran a company, I had employees. And we did electronics in homes, like smart home systems, like on steroids. And we were doing these three-story townhomes. And I had this guy that worked for me that kept making mistakes. And he hit a water line on the third story. Anyone who, like, yeah. Destroyed. All, they just sheetrocked the place. We couldn't find the shutoff. I wasn't even there. I was somewhere else. And I was thinking, man, I don't want to use that guy anymore. Come on, put, your, put it in your perspective. Who's got a car wash guy that you've used? And they don't do a good job. Like one time. Well, they're just not that good. I just use that because we have a car wash guy that helps clean the vans at the church. How about a house cleaner? And you're like, I am a house cleaner. I wish I could fire myself. <laughs> what am I trying to get at here? That's not the nature of God. And I'm not saying like, just don't apply this in that regard. It's, it's about the nature of God. As he says, yeah, I'm still going to stay committed to humanity. Even when you're not. Because one was, I'll accept all of your nonsense. Now, I don't know what to do with that. Other then turn and say, I don't want to be committed to all this. I, that seems like it's pretty valuable and worthwhile of someone to be around. I thought that would be a pretty easy going. Like I'm telling you, the nature of God and how awesome he is. And Christ made that and showed that possible, made it able for us to be accepted in that. That is a crazy thought. But here we are, ungrown up. Adults. And all of Scripture is trying to get us to this idea of you walk one way or the other, you can't be double-minded. It's all or nothing. And I know that is not what you've thought and that's not what we want it to say. We have story after story, marriage being the primary concept of this idea of commitment and no other. And Christ is called that for us. I do want to share just one little piece about the armor of God stuff, and we'll just save this for another week, but I just want to share one piece. Is that cool? Let's go to Ephesians 6, 10. I encourage you all, not because we're trying to get YouTube views, but we have done an entire series a while back on the armor of God. We will do it again, I'm sure, at some point in detail, but it's an eight-week uh, series online on YouTube. It's called Game of Thrones. It has nothing to do with the TV show Game of Thrones. We just called it that because it's fun and provocative and it gets the people going. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> It's all on the armor of God. It's eight weeks. You can go watch that. I'm not going to do and talk at this in detail. I just want to get you one concept and idea this morning, and then we'll revisit all this apparently next week uh, for it. This is what it says. I'm just going to read it to you, and then we're going to talk about it. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having a breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, and having your feet feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you may be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching whereunto you persevere 
and supplications for all saints, which is you, or rather supposed to be, but I'm going to, I'm marking off the premise that this is you. There's just a couple of things I want to point out in this. Again, we want to do all the detailed deep dive. We did that, and we will do it again, I'm sure, at some point, about all of the definitions from the beginning, about all of the stuff at the beginning, and all each piece of the armor. But what I want to point out today is just a couple of core things about this passage. Number one, this is taking the approach that we just talked about. The underpinning of all reality is spiritual. How do we know he's taking that approach? Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So not your might, but his might. But on the whole armor of God, which also seems to be metaphorical. Okay? There's not like a real armor of God. Okay? Even though we have real armor as an, as a, as an idea. Okay? It's not real. Everybody say it's his metaphorical armor. Okay? People get weird. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, okay, like an ambush. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, and then he lists a bunch of things that are all spiritual ideas. His underpinning of nature of what you're actual wrestling with and problems in life are not actually natural problems. His view of life is the same view of life that Christ had where he said, actually all the issues in this world stem from a spiritual place. And all of the issues and problems and things that you're wrestling against, being is that you're a believer, and being is that you're saying you're a saint and you're following this thing, there is nothing in this world that you're dealing with that is not fundamentally founded and that you're wrestling against that is not actually a spiritual thing. Whether it be wrestling within your own spirit or outside of that, you are wrestling with spiritual things. Every single thing in your life right now, if I had somebody, I pro you probably couldn't even fit three. You probably have like a hundred problems in your life. You could probably list a hundred problems in your life faster than you can list a hundred great things in your life. Couldn't you? Tell the truth, shame the devil, raise your hand if you probably could. Why? Naturally minded. It's death. It ends. You're focused on those things. So what does this say? He says the underpinning reality of this is what you're actually struggling with. Spiritual things. Whoa. That means every time I come to encounter something, what I'm actually wrestling against is a spiritual thing. Now, some of you are going to go weird with this. And I'm going to use something kind of somewhat outlandish, but I'm sure someone actually has done this. Actually, I know people have. Sad, sad to say. Who's ever got a flat tire? It's the devil, Bobby. You get a flat tire, and you're out there on the side of the road. This was the devil, and I'm wrestling against the devil, and he's trying to make me late for work. No, you didn't change your tires. Which actually we need to do, honey. Uh, <laughs> All right, now I know that's a little bit crazy one. But how about you're dealing with someone at work or a situation or whatever it is, and you're looking at it, and what you do is you take that scripture, twist it to your own mechanisms, and say, ah, this is happening to me because something's coming against me. No, that's not what he's trying to say. Let me help you out with this. What he's saying is every situation is underpinned by spiritual. And what you're wrestling against is are you going to be the spirit in it or are you going to complicitly be a part of the enemy? That's your choice. It's not you're actually wrestling against the actual thing. You're wrestling against how you respond to it. You're wrestling against whether or not I'm going to be a saint and stay in this or you're rather wrestling with whether or not I'm going to start missing the mark and be a part of it. That's the wrestling. Do I stay the path of Christ? Not because I'm trying to do the right thing and earn my way to heaven, but because I am here and a part of this grand story. The underpinning of reality is the spirit of God and he chose humanity to bring that about. And so what I am wrestling against spiritually is when I step into this, am I going to bring the spirit of God and be Christ to the world or am I going to be a part of this? That's what you're wrestling against. Now he doesn't leave us hanging. I'm almost done, I promise. Well, actually, I'm not, but for today, we'll hit pause. Tune in next time for more really long, screaming, yelling, preaching. It's not what we're battling against. Everybody say, it's spiritual. And he says, so take the full armor of God, this metaphorical thing. What does armor do? Protects you. Protects you from what? 
not bad things happening, but that the bad things that are happening don't affect you. Oh, it's a crazy idea. Guess what? If I put on this helmet again, what does it do? Bryce can't hit me with that ginormous sword. Where'd you even get a sword that big? It was bring your own sword day, by the way. If I put this on, don't hit me hard. If I put this on, swing your sword, sir, lightly, please. Does this, that is so long. <laughs> that is, can you like freedom and throw, okay. So does this stop that from hitting me? But what does it do? It makes my ears ring. No, it protects that when it does hit me, it does not affect me. Uh oh. The same way that it did, it may affect me a little bit, but it doesn't affect me the same way. And the better my armor is, the better it won't affect me. You see that? I was going to let him actually hit me, but that is. Okay, it's still in my face. I was afraid Bryce may take out some anger on me. What is it saying? So the idea of the armor is it's something around you, something with you that God has given to you and sharing with you that does what? Protects you, not from the things not happening, but from how you respond and how it affects you. So if you find yourself being affected by something and it doesn't quite line up with the Spirit of God affecting you, then you must say, I must not be surrounded and in the right armor. Good Lord, I'm going to hit somebody's head. Yeah, they used to say, step on your toes. I think I'm going for the jugular right now. I am going to share this really, really roughly, but it's because I love all of you and you're like my family. Yeah, we're church, we're family. Okay, so I am so tired of hearing everybody tell me how bad a situation is and how they want out of it. No, be happy. Count it all joy when suffering comes. Why? Because I get to put on the arm. I get to be the one that brings it. I get to be a light bringer in this situation. Look at it as an opportunity to say, whoa, more chaos. How do I bring some order to it? No one thinks that way. No, because we want to be the victim. And it's so hard. But Christ says, you're more than conquerors when you're what? In me, in relationship with me. So be over here and look at it and count it all joy and say, this is another opportunity for someone else to see the spirit of God, for someone else to get Christ. This is the opportunity that the kingdom of God prevails against death, chaos, and destruction. And you want to know why it's not? Because the church ain't doing it. And guess who the church is? You. Do you want to know why you ain't doing it? Because you don't think Christ is real because it doesn't underpin your reality. Pentecostal is coming out with a high-pitched voice. Like, I feel like a little Michael Jackson with it. Ah, I don't know. Um, do you see this? Christy's having to gather herself. <laughs> well, I was going to go, <laughs> but I can't dance at all. Do you see this? Isn't that a fundamentally different way of looking at life? Isn't that's what Christ did, guys? That's what he did. Everywhere he went, you're blind? No, we're going to bring some order to this chaos. Oh, you're a leper and everybody's running away from you? I'm going to run to you and I'm going to show you. I'm going to touch the unclean thing and they're going to become clean because everywhere I go. And he says, whoa, that same spirit, that same power is supposed to reside in you. So why are you running? Oh, because it's not real. Y'all see this? Wow, look at life now. It's like all the darkness starts going. Whoo, colors become real. This is a whole different way. This is what the scripture's all about. I'm sorry you haven't been told it. I know it's like, man, this sounds pretty tough and rough, but yet exciting. And I kind of want to do it. It's like, yeah, that's some good news. Okay, one more thing. What does he say? So then he says, this armor that surrounds you, that protects you, the way that you, I get to bring it. It doesn't affect me the same way. It's my opportunity to respond. And then what does he do? He says, now let me share, share with you what this armor is like. Like Everybody say, it's like this. Not literally this. Similar to it. It's the concept, okay? What does it say right here? Take the whole armor. Say, hey, the whole thing, bro. Say it. Say, whole thing, bro. 
seeing my dad say bro is kind of funny. <laughs> Notice how many times he says something. Verse 13, let's start. Wherefore you take on the whole thing, bro, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all. Stand. And then what's the start of the next one? Stand. Therefore, having, and then he lists it all. There's a lot to do with standing, staying in this place. Hint, hint. Like concrete, being formed in the image of God. Christ says, you're there. The only way you get out of it is if you choose to walk out of it. So therefore, stand in it. Stay in it. Stay in the armor, in the protection to where every time that you react, you bring more of the kingdom. Stay in it. Quit running around and running amok. The example of this in scripture, we've talked about a lot. What is marriage? A commitment to one person and no one else that you are supposed to what? Stay in it, in a relationship forever. Meaning there's no way out. And the only part that's different in your natural marriage and the one with God is until death do us part. But if you're eternal, there is no parting. Do you see this? So he says, stand, stay in it. Holy, dedicated, consistent, like a saint. Turn to the person beside you and say, I'm a saint. Oh, that doesn't roll quite off the tongue as much as I'm a sinner. Well, maybe you should focus on spiritual things instead of natural things. I'm a saint. Uh-oh, remember this. We said this last week. Saints doesn't mean you never mess up and that you are perfect. It means you're committed to it. We said it this way. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. He says, oh, I'm going to be a saint. And so then he gives us these things. He says, it's like this. Let's, let's talk about them real quick. What's the first one? Having your loins girded about with truth. I'm not going to go into extreme detail, but the idea is what does a belt do? It surrounds you. Yes, it holds your pants up. The idea of the belt was that it surrounds you and it helps take some weight off of some other parts of the armor. But the idea that it carries in Scripture is reproductive things being protected. So let what you reproduce be truth. Okay, so it says that's the truth, surrounded by truth. What's the next one? We're just going to go through them real quick. Breastplate of righteousness. What's the breastplate? Covers your chest, heart. What is righteousness? Right standing. Just keep this in the right standing because the only way it comes out is by you choosing to what's right standing well like christ because i'm following christ what was christ standing humble committed keep it humble what's the next one i'm getting these are very very brief feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace what does it mean the word shod means to be tethered to or tied to i think of putting on shoes on a horse because see, it's not like your shoes our shoes we take off when you put shoes on a horse you like nail it in to their feet and they don't come off all that easily and then i think of a tether ball okay like think of a tether ball what does a tether ball do you hit it and it just goes and it just it can't leave this tethered to i can't go and so it says that your, your, your feet are shod. Your path, your walking feet are tied to what? To having my good life. No, to preparing the good news of the gospel, of the unity of Christ and unity of us with God. That is the idea of peace. That's the path I am tied to. That's the path I am committed to, is to see the unity of humanity, peace, everything. I'm tied to that, to bring in the good news. That's the path I'm walking. Well, you don't understand. Nope. This is the path I'm walking. It's time that Christians quit being bubble boys. Y'all ever seen that movie, Bubble Boy? I said show it to your kids. Don't show it to your kids. I realized and remembered it has a lot of things in it. Let your kids get older. However, the concept was, ah, I just can't touch anything because he's like this anemic guy. It's time to get some grit, some determination. As a believer that says, I cannot be dissuaded from this path. There's nothing that can come my way that will dissuade me. Not nothing's going to come my way because I'm tripping on rainbows, unicorns, and bulletproof marshmallows. No, when it comes my way, I ain't moving. Okay. 
Some of you are like, yeah, we ain't moving. You've been talking for two hours. Your feet, and what's the last few pieces here? The shield of faith. The idea of a shield is that it is a protection mechanism. To s- when things come at you, what do you do? You boop. One of the core ideas behind this is the shield was, back then was made to protect half of you and half of the person beside you in the Roman infantry. Church. But just, now I'm not using this for people attending, but just like right now, if we said, shield wall, because I've been, I love, you know, y'all love the battles and stuff like that. There's gaps in the shield. Not because we need more people here, but because we ain't bonded together. Well, because I don't like how Albie does this, and he didn't ask my question, right, on the Q&A. And, <laughs> and you know, Dwayne and Jill, they live in Belize. I won't ever get to know them all that well, so, you know. You know. And <laughs> can you believe some of those teenagers don't put on deodorant all the time? not getting close to them. Now, I'm using goofy things, but that's exactly what we do because we, we try to bond together over anything other than the one thing we're supposed to be bonded in, which is the Spirit of Christ. So I ain't moving. There's nothing you can do, you can say, to dissuade me from this path, and I'm not going to let you be dissuaded either. We're going to stay together on this. We may not like each other's mannerisms and this and that and the other and like the, that he does this and they do that, but it doesn't matter. We're one. We're going to stay this way. And then what did Jesus say? They'll know you're my disciples, the ones that are disciplined in this, by your what? Love for one another. Not necessarily your ooey-gooey passionate. No, your commitment to cause their betterment, and their betterment is to stay in the kingdom and moving in this path, and we ain't going to be dissuaded from it no matter how much we tick each other off. The church could learn that lesson a thing or two. I told you, I'm talking to home folk. So that's why it's coming out different. What's the last two pieces? The helmet of salvation. What's the helmet do? Protect the mind with salvation. To be healed, to be rescued. Guess what? You can stop your ridiculous line of thought. In Christ, you can't stop it. Like It's just going to keep going crazy. You're going to wake up because of a dream you had and you're going to run off by the end of the day thinking that your wife is cheating on you, that your kids are, are, are running around like hellions and that the people at your job really think this and that everyone in the church hates you and like you're just going to come up with some crazy stuff. James. Why? You can't stop it. But in Christ, you can. What does in Christ mean? In relation to how he did, how he thought, well, I'm going to stay here. And what does that require? My internal life has to be shifted. Okay, what's the last one? The sword. The sword of the Spirit. And then he says, just in case you're not really aware of what that one is, which is the word of God, which guys, 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 listen to this very clearly. They weren't talking about the Bible. The Bible in its compact form like this did not exist at the time this was written. Now the old Testament scripture did some of the new Testament writings were there, but they were not compacted together. So when he says the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, what he is referring to, which is the truth spoken word and yes, some written word, but is the speech and the mannerisms and the replications of who God is. And it happens to be written on these pages, but it is also supposed to be in you. So Trying to constantly put buffers between us and the Spirit of God and say, oh, which is the sword of the Spirit? I'm just going to read this. It's like, no, it's supposed to be in you. The very words that come out of your mouth are supposed to speak life just as God did in the beginning. It says everything about you is supposed to be in this manner, and that's the sword. And yes, this is where you can find great, this is how you know. It's the check of am I about to say something that's God? Let me check. Well, seems like they all agree too. Pat the litmus test. Leave it alone. Okay. Let me show you how this works together real quick. It starts with truth and it ends with the spirit. I want to read it how I kind of wrote it down. I say kind of wrote it down because it was very shorthand. But Every piece of the armor is intended to work off of each other. 
That's why it says the whole thing. Because it starts with truth. And guess what? If you don't know the truth of who God is, the truth of Christ, you can never be in right standing with him because you'll never understand the manners of Christ. You'll never understand Christ. You'd never be in right standing with it. And you won't know how to stand. You won't know how to be humble, nor would you want to. But it starts with truth. Then with that truth, it puts your heart in the right standing of who Christ is. And if you don't have the truth of that, and you ain't standing righteous, you can never have peace and never be at one unity with, in peace with God, and you ain't going to walk through life that way, that's for sure. Then would you ever have faith? How could you possibly have faith in something that you don't know, you're not even in, in relationship with, and then you ain't even like walking with? You can't. And then what's the next piece after faith? Salvation. What is that? To be rescued. You don't know him. How is he saving you? And what's the next piece? The spirit. How could you be filled with the spirit, which is him? Do you see how these are all? You can't have peace. You won't know him. They're all intended to be kind of looked at as this one cohesive thought and idea that this creates it. But it starts with the realization of the truth of who God is, what his will, plan, and purpose is, and how Christ is the fullness of that. And with that, I can now walk into the right standing because of where I am in place. So my heart stays humble to that because that's the most important thing because I understand the truth of it. And then when my heart is humble to that, then I am walking in a place of peace because it doesn't really matter what happens happens to me because it's starting to protect me. And then in that, when I'm walking in that peace, now I'm beginning to see the fact that I can have trust and faith, not just belief in separately like God exists, but I can actually trust that God, you know what, if I die tomorrow, it's okay. God's got my wife. God's got my kids. I walk in a whole different line of thought when I begin to think in this manner. And then when I see that I have that kind of faith, I know that I, I know I'm eternal and saved through Christ. It's the most ludicrous thing that Christians have bought into that you can't prove you're saved. Yeah, I can. Not Maybe not to you, but I know I am. Ooh, watch me, watch me. Then I began to walk in the Spirit, not after the flesh. I began to live in the Spirit. I began to look at everything in a different light. And it ain't the weird, fake, religious walking in the Spirit where I just quote Scripture on every other occasion because it makes me feel better. And I just tell somebody the nonsense that is not backed up in Scripture. Well, that wouldn't be happening to you if you come back to church. No! I don't need them to go somewhere else to get the gospel. I am going to live and breathe the gospel. I walk them straight to Christ. Will it be in one moment? Nope, God ain't in a hurry. Maybe it's in 10 years from now, but I ain't gonna stop. If God didn't give up on you, you don't give up on whatever project he put in your way. Because hands down, I can guarantee you, you start walking in this path, what God is gonna do is place people in your life that he says, now, you're being a disciple of me, you walk them to me and stay with them in this process. Hint, hint, the first people he does that to is your family. The church has abandoned this too, and this is where I'll shut up. Do it to your spouse if you're married. Look at your spouse and say, I am going to be Christ to my spouse. Oh, that struck a rough nerve right there. It's about to get harder. Be Christ to your children. Even when they don't live in your house anymore, so don't try to get out of it, you buffering people. Trying to place things. Well, they don't live in my house. I don't have to. I, I, it'll be this person that I see every two weeks. No, the people that you interact with daily. Start there. What use is it to gain the whole world and to lose the ones that God placed beside you? Families bonded back on a home level, Christ as the central point, and then let it spread from now, there, into your workplaces, into your extended family. And don't think of it as, I want to tell them about Jesus. Oh, I know that doesn't sound, oh, you don't want me to tell them about Jesus? No, I want you to be Jesus. Oh, oh, that is blasphemy. No, Romans 8 says he was the firstborn of many brethren. You're supposed to walk it out. And not that they see you, you become nameless in it. And what they actually end up doing is saying, man, where are you? How do you even look at things like this? Let me tell you about this dude. 
You're like a person with a flashlight. And you ain't going, this little light of mine, look how pretty I am. You're saying, this little light of mine, boom, that way, that way. This is where we're going. This is where we're going. I'm just walking with you. Yeah, I know, I know. Stop playing with your crap. Let's go. But let it start in the family.